Hey what's up everybody, my name is Trofinet the Babbling Belgian and welcome to today's video. And not just any video. Today we'll be talking about The Witcher 3 and more specifically its introduction, White Orchard. We'll take a look at why it's one of the best intros of any game and how it achieved this while also touching on a few things it did wrong. Before we dive in I'd like to ask you guys for some feedback. I spend a lot of time working on this video, so any pointers you can give me to improve on my work are always appreciated, and if you'd liked it, let me know as well. You just might make my day. Everyone still here? Let's go! The Witcher 3 had a lot of weight on its shoulders when it was originally released. Preceded by and based on a whopping 8 books and 2 games, there was a lot of ground to cover in the introduction if CD Projekt Red wanted to keep the attention of any newcomers. And since this was the first game in the series released for a PlayStation console, that entire market would be almost guaranteed to dive into a deep world without any prior knowledge alongside newcomers on the other platforms. This meant that not only did the game need to teach the player how to play it, it also needed to introduce the characters, factions, world, rules and history in the span of a few hours, while still keeping both new and returning players interested. It does this in a few ingenious ways. First up, we have the tutorial dream sequence. When you boot up the game, you get an intro cinematic showing Geralt and Vesemir tracking Yennefer, switching between past and present so we see what happened on the battlefield that the witches are investigating for clues. Even if you're unfamiliar with the series, the initial premise is quite clear. Two men are looking for a woman with powerful magical abilities. After the cinematic, however, the tone shifts and we are greeted with the infamous bath scene in Kaer Morhen. We are subsequently introduced to Yennefer, Vesemir and Ciri, each with a few minutes of one-on-one -on -one dialogue, giving you a basic idea of who these characters are. The strong-willed lover, the old and grumpy mentor, and the chipper young protege. No need for details or depth just yet, this is an introduction. We also get some gameplay tutorials by means of Ciri and the last two wolf school witchers, Eskel and Lambert, immediately also introducing Kaer Morhen as the home of these people, for players who are not familiar with the series as a whole. During training, the tone shifts once again when Ciri exits the castle grounds, Geralt discovers a corpse in one of the training dummies, and snow starts rolling in, signaling the arrival of our main antagonist, the titular Wild Hunt, after which Geralt wakes up in a shock. So the dream sequence performs quadruple duty, all in less than an hour. It introduces us to a bunch of the main characters, provides gameplay introductions, links up with our current goal by starting on Yennefer, and ends on our actual goal by showing us the disappearance and death of Ciri and the arrival of the Wild Hunt. Attentive fans also get a few kicks out of this sequence, because it shows us two incredibly important characters that were mostly absent from the previous games, Yennefer and Ciri. And if you follow the entire series altogether, you can recognize this sequence as a dream instead of a flashback from the start, since, as Geralt put it, Yennefer never visited Kaer Morhen before. And I do love that one of the most remembered scenes in the game, the bathtub, didn't actually happen. Points to how well this game begins. The only real problem I have with this sequence is that this is one of the only times we get to see Ciri and especially Yennefer in the first 20 to 30 hours of the game. They are such important characters but are largely ignored and only referenced for almost half the game. I'll probably do a different video later on the disservice this game does to Jennifer specifically and how it impacted the whole Team Triss vs Team Yen discussion, because I really do have some things I want to talk about on that topic as well. But enough about the dream sequence, let's not get sidetracked and talk about what follows. White Orchard, that's what we're here for after all. Character wise, once it properly starts off, the game purposefully keeps the cast of characters small to ease players into the world. White Orchard is all about organic world building from both a gameplay and a lore perspective. Aside from Vesemir, you only talk to a handful of other characters over the course of the next 5 hours, none of which are important beyond the scope of the introduction. Aside from one, you can guess who that is. Even the main antagonist of this section, the Royal Griffin, is a monster, not a person, and the main conflict of the game is only introduced once you leave White Orchard. This frees up the time you spend in White Orchard so you can get familiar with the world and all its different aspects on your own terms. Which brings us to the game's introduction to player choice. After a short scuffle with some ghouls, Geralt and Vesemir stumble upon an upturned cart with a merchant hiding underneath. The merchant's horse is actively being devoured by his attacker, a massive royal griffin. The witches don't hesitate, they're monster slayers after all, but after a few hits the griffin flies off with the horse, injuring Vesemir in the process. 
The merchant, grateful to his rescuers, gives you your first choice. A simple one, accept the merchant's coin or let him keep it. Most of the choices in White Orchard boil down to the same decision. It's a choice with very little consequences, but it is immediately followed by some sound advice from Vesemir once you enter the local inn. Witchers are neutral. They don't usually get involved, but on the other hand, the choice to act will always be yours to make. Are you the Geralt who can't help but jump in at any point, or the one who takes his coin and doesn't meddle in another's affairs, for better or for worse? The inn also introduces the overall factions on the continent. Take that down before there's trouble. That is a coat of arms, the Temerian lilies. They've a right to hang there. This ain't Temeria no more, old man. It's Nilfgaard now. In one small conversation between villagers and the innkeeper, it becomes clear that this was once Temeria, part of the Northern Realms, but after the battle from the beginning cinematic, is now occupied by Nilfgaard, the empire from the south slowly taking over the land. It's a simplification, of course, of the situation, but it's enough to get new players started. Again, the details come later. After that, you are urged to ask around the inn in regards to Yennefer's whereabouts. Here, the game makes another very smart move. Vesemir goes to sit down on one end of the inn, while the person that actually has information on Yennefer, the devil you know, Gaunt Odim, is on the complete opposite end of the building, out of sight when you start your interrogations. This encourages you to talk to everyone and teaches you about one of your witcher signs in the process, Axie. Basically the Jedi mind trick, Axie allows you to calm down or persuade certain people during conversations. The act itself is rather morally grey, however, since you're essentially brainwashing someone to make them work in your favour. It's also not a get out of jail free card, which the game is all too happy to teach you on your first try since the other villager at the table freaks out when you manipulate his friend, showing you it only works on one person at a time. When you leave the inn and try to use it against the thugs that jump you outside the bar, the game immediately punishes you for it and the remaining men attack you. Axie doesn't work on multiple targets, so choose your dialogue options carefully is the lesson here. The second person you meet in the inn is a scholar who teaches you about Gwent. I don't need to explain what that is, probably. Even in this conversation you get a choice, though. The scholar wants to go to the front to chronicle the battle. Geralt can either encourage him to do so or convince him to stay away, warning him that the battlefield is no place for a scholar. Your decision determines whether he actually leaves or not, so pick carefully. The final person you meet is Gaunter himself, who actually knows both the Yennefer and Geralt by name. A minor character who just puts you on the right track at first, Gaunter turns out to be a major player later on in the Hearts of Stone DLC. It's awesome to come back to this scene to find such an important character who, in hindsight, clearly knows a lot more than he's letting on. The devil's in the details. After that, Vesemir leaves you alone so he can heal and the story can focus solely on Geralt for a while. The surrounding area opens up for exploration, giving you more options. You can head directly to the Nilfgaardian camp to inquire about Yennefer, which will continue the main quest. But the Nilfgaardian officer there will only divulge Yennefer's location once the griffin is dispatched, setting you up for an involved hunt. Choice is the running team here, however. You can choose to go in the opposite direction or complete any of the numerous side quests, which is exactly what we're going to talk about next. The Griffin Quest is a carefully constructed masterpiece designed to introduce you to the harshness of the world, the different factions and of course the gameplay flow of hunting a monster, preparing for battle and eliminating it effectively. The Griffin is the first imposing creature you meet, but you only chase it off, you don't kill it. Remember, witches don't work for free. More world building. It's only once Peter, the Nilfgaardian officer, promises you information in return for the Griffin's head that Geralt actually sets out to kill it. This quest is really good at teaching the player that nothing is black and white in this world. Nothing and no one is inherently evil. Each person and creature just has a different world view and different priorities. The Nilfgaardian sounded like an evil empire until now, but even through his foreign accent, Peter is friendly, just doing his job, seizing only what he deems necessary. He tries to set the people at ease, despite being the conqueror in this case, even asking for less than what the villagers themselves claim to be able to provide. He just needs the food for his soldiers under his command, and he just wants everyone to be safe. He only punishes them once they try to screw him over with some spoiled grain. Even the griffin isn't attacking people for the sake of it. 
During your investigation with the hunter Mislav, you discover that the Nilf Guardians actually killed the Griffin's mate. Sending it into a frenzy and expanding its territory to find more humans, it deems dangerous. Two sides to every coin. Regardless, with the help of Tomia the Herbalist, you manage to lure the griffin to an open field and equipped with a new crossbow and some new potions, you manage to kill it. I love how the crossbow and potions are only really introduced by the end of the griffin quest, allowing players to focus on their science and sword play first during one of the few older side quests in White Orchard. There's plenty of side quests, but there's three of them in White Orchard that, to me, provide the most world building. Missing in Action, Twisted Firestarter and The Devil by the Well. Since we're still talking about Nilfgaard, let's talk about Missing in Action first. A man called June is looking for his brother who went missing after the battle against Nilfgaard. He's presumed dead, but would appreciate it to be able to bury his brother, so Geralt goes looking for the corpse. Instead of a corpse, however, he finds the brother very much alive, talking to a Nilfgaardian soldier. Both are exhausted and wounded, found each other on the battlefield and saw the futility of continuing to fight in a war that wasn't theirs. So they dragged each other away from the battle and hid in a shack. Dune is overjoyed to find his brother alive, but is hesitant to accept the Nilfgaardian. It's up to you to either convince Dune to take in the Nilfgaardian soldier as well, changing his name so the Empire never finds out, or leaving him to die. It's a touching story of two men on opposite sides of a war they don't really care for, and how even though their countries are at odds with one another, that doesn't mean every citizen of those countries is opposed as well. Again indicating there's a lot of grey area here. Less of a grey area in our next side quest, however. Oh, got a wee bit chilly the night, so I set fire to my forge. Got a nice and roaring. Roasted some wieners. In Twisted Firestarter, the local dwarven blacksmith is furious because someone set his forge ablaze. Seems the locals aren't too happy about Willis making weapons for the Nilfgaardians, even if he's forced to do it for free. After a little bit of investigation, Geralt quickly discovers the culprit, a man called Nap, with a deep hatred for dwarves. This is a good first indication of the existing unrest between humans and non-humans. Nap felt like he can be excused for his actions because of his hatred, a sentiment that seems to grow in more and more people, judging from the reactions Geralt himself gets from some of the villagers he bumps into. Letting someone get away with an act like that would set a dangerous precedent, and the game shows this as well. If you let the arsonist go, a few days later, another fire will destroy what was left of the forge in the first place, robbing you of the only blacksmith in White Orchard permanently. Turning Nap in, on the other hand, also doesn't end well. The Nilfgaardians see the destruction of the forge as sabotage, which is punishable by death. Sentence executed immediately. It's a short quest that sets the tone for many decisions and consequences to come. The last quest, The Devil in the Well, is a monster hunt and a perfect example of the attention to detail CD Projekt Red puts into these quests. Odolan, a local, is looking for someone to slay a ghost haunting his well. It's been haunted for over 20 years, but they used to get their water from the river instead. But so many corpses floating in it after the battle is turned noxious. His daughter is sick because of the dirty water and the well now seems like the only solution. On entering the abandoned settlement, it's immediately clear there was a fight here. The houses and the well are trashed and if you arrive around noon, the devil shows herself immediately. A noon wraith. But the quest does a great job of keeping things interesting and teaching the player some vital rules of monster slaying along the way. The wraith cannot be killed at first since it is bound to something in the village. This not only lengthens the quest, it also forces the player to investigate what exactly happened 20 years ago and where the wraith comes from. After some investigation, Geralt finds the diary of a woman named Claire who chronicled the events of Hovel, the settlement they started to get away from their abusive lord. She also talks about her relationship with her husband-to-be, Volker, and their life together. The last entry, however, indicates that the lord was on his way to negotiate their terms to come back to the village. The corpses and blood trails still littering Hovel tell the rest of the story. You eventually find Claire's corpse hanging from the bucket rope in the well, executed by the vengeful lord, and now haunting the well until someone frees her from her ties to the settlement. The game leaves you to your own devices for most of the upcoming fight, providing hints at what to do through Geralt's dialogue, but not forcing you to anything except reading the bestiary entry on noon raids. The weaknesses described there make the fight a lot easier, however, 
This is not a walk in the park, which is again by design. If players weren't paying attention before, a few quick deaths will teach them to prepare better and read up on what works and what doesn't. All the info is there if you look for it and it follows the same flow for almost every monster hunt in the rest of the game. But if you think that the details in this quest end there, you are mistaken. There is actually a hidden story in the history of White Orchard that ties into the Devil in the Well quest. If you talk to Tamira the herbalist after finishing the quest, you can ask her about Claire, since they were best friends before Claire left to found Hovel. Tomira tells you that the Lord was supposed to convince Volker, Claire and the rest of their family to come back peacefully, but that it all turned into a bloodbath because of something Claire said about the Lord's son, Florian. If the name Florian rings a bell, it's because Florian comes up in an optional conversation with Mislav, the hunter that helps you find the griffin. Mislav tells you he was excommunicated from White Orchard a long time ago because he was considered a freak. If you continue this line of inquiry, he eventually confesses that he was in a romantic relationship with the Lord's son, Florian. When they were caught in the act, Florian hung himself, causing the Lord to start drinking, eventually ruining the estate, the ruins of which you can still visit around White Orchard. Connect the dots and things start to clear up. Claire, in a fit of fury, probably started provoking the Lord, laughing in his face about the relationship of his son with Mislav, something she picked up while in White Orchard, assuming the Lord didn't already know. Little did she know that the Lord found out in the meantime and that Florian committed suicide. Claire's skating remarks finally pushing the Lord over the edge, ordering his men to seize her and murder the other inhabitants of Hovel, only to execute Claire in the same way his son took his own life hanging her in the well. In his eyes, a fitting punishment for the insults she was throwing his way. White Orchard doesn't have a lord anymore when we arrive there, but we even know how that story ended. The innkeeper says as much. Seems they hanged the lord. An ironic death for a now broken man we never actually meet. Aside from all of the world building, character and faction introductions and quests, White Orchard is also a perfect vertical gameplay slice of the full game if you start exploring. It has a bit of literally everything right along the main quest, so you get a feel for what's to come. Simple things like a shop, an inn, a blacksmith and a herbalist are a given. But there's also an army camp you visit during the main quest, multiple bandit camps that could factor into one of the other side quests, a few monster nests that can be destroyed and multiple pieces of guarded treasures. As we already discussed, there's a fleshed out monster hunt quest, but also a partial set of specialized witcher gear you can craft since you can get the Viper School sword diagrams in the graveyard and the castle ruins nearby. That same graveyard also introduces places of power, obelisks that allow you to temporarily boost a specific sign and give you a free ability point. Did you know there's actually six of them around White Orchard? One for every sign and one extra, making it a perfect place to get the Power Overwhelming trophy to have all of them active at the same time and to score some easy ability points. White Orchard also houses an impressive array of diverse monsters and beasts to fight for a tutorial area. Next to the Griffin, Ghouls and Noon Raid we already discussed, we have Drowners, Normal Raids, Wild Dogs, Wolves, Bears and even a Water Hag close to the Guardian camp. Each has a different weakness, preparing players for more complicated fights later on in the game and forcing them to use their entire toolset. All in all, White Orchard is the perfect introduction to a massive and incredibly well-crafted game world. By carefully designing the opening moments and limiting the amount of characters therein, but giving a wide choice in gameplay activities, CD Projekt Red managed to entice millions of players to explore the continent and experience Geralt and Ciri's story in full. It's a masterclass in game design that shows how important those first few hours are in a game to keep a player's attention and interest while still teaching them about gameplay mechanics characters and the world. What did you like most about the White Orchard? Did you have a specific part of The Witcher 3 you want me to talk about? Let me know in the comment section down below and if you like this video there's a lot more where this came from. I have full playthroughs of both The Witcher 3 which was some of my earlier work so keep that in mind and Thronebreaker on the channel as well as weekly Gwent videos which will start up soon again I promise. So feel free to check these out as well. Thank you enormously for watching and I hope to see you again in one of my other videos or series. Goodbye and thanks for watching.